you can build somebody's math knowledge up. I'm looking for somebody who's got heart, who looks at a student and says like, I've got that kid's back. Like I'm gonna stick with them, whether they drive me crazy or not. That genuine faith in students is so much harder to cultivate than content knowledge. And, I, and I'm glad you said that faith in students, not the need to save students, but the genuine faith in the kid's ability. You work for Teaching Lab. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Currently, I am a, a director of program at Teaching Lab. I move from mostly thinking about content and our professional learning to now supporting specific project teams, interfacing with our partners, thinking about what are their specific needs, designing professional learning that meets that need. It could be coaching. It could be teacher PL. It could be school leader PL. It could be instructional walkthroughs. So it's sort of similar to just thinking about professional learning, but this time I kind of get to do it in the context of a specific partner. Prior to that though, right? I know you have a love and a passion for math. So you were leading the math team, right? Tell us about that work. Math education has always been about more than math. You know, not to be, not to like speak in hyperbole, but like, Math and education more broadly is liberation. That was kind of an angle that when I first came to teaching lab, I was really excited to kind of get to figure out what does that mean to kind of bring that type of thinking to math professional learning. Um, so in the last year, I've just been really excited to work with a team of people who are really committed to thinking about what does educational equity and racial educational equity look like in math instruction? How can we support teachers, school leaders through our professional learning services and helping them unpack that and begin to like either analyze the systems that they have in place that, you know, harm students, disadvantage students, but also ramp up some of the practices that they do that value and center them. Math is liberation. Okay, that's a pretty strong statement. Where is that statement coming from? A little bit of bell hooks, uh -huh. a little bit of um, Bob Moses. He wrote this book, Radical. I mean, he did a lot of things, but to distill it down to one book he wrote. But he wrote a book, Radical Equations, that I read during my graduate program, my teacher prep program. And I, it just put into words something that I had been starting to feel about education. And I'm also really lucky. My mother also really instilled a deep sense of like education is important and education is what you need to be economically free. So I, I think that I had seen enough students kind of be like shut out of that, um, denied that access. So by the time I made it to my teacher prep program and I was beginning to hear about how education is liberatory, it just, it started to kind of all click into place. And I think math, especially math is kind of like this, this privileged subject. Like when you think about who math Maticians are, they are usually white men. And that is like not factually accurate. <laughs> like right, historic representation. When about, <laughs> yeah, when you think yeah. about mathematics, it is significantly more diverse. But I think culturally, when we think about it, it is a very privileged subject area. And we, in our minds, believe only a certain few mm -hmm. can, you know, be privy to that knowledge. So when I think about it as like, liberation i think about it as having access to something we've been historically denied much the way that literacy mm -hmm. was denied you know in our at least in our american history to blacks i i think that math education is also denied actively denied to students what does it mean to say that students access to math instruction is denied especially for a teacher who may be thinking but what? Like, I have the textbook, I'm teaching math every day. What do you mean I'm denying students access to mathematics? Things like telling kids, it's okay not to be a math person. Mm -hmm. We just like step back and we think about that phrase, it's okay not to be a math person. We would never say it's okay not to be a reading person. It's okay not to read, it's, it's okay, okay not to read. write. It's okay not to be curious. Like that's, that's wild, you would never say that but we normalize one that is that it is okay not to engage in the subject 
when you begin to like analyze kind of habits of interaction in classrooms, who's getting chances to speak, who's getting chances to, to do the deep thinking, the people who are often, the students who are often left out of that are black and brown students, students with disabilities, our English language learners, female students. To me, those are kind of the subtle ways. I think it is both a combination of maybe a teacher's individual bias, as well as bias that's like racially motivated, socially motivated, but also this collective image that we have in our minds around like who is successful in math. And I think that that's obviously tied to racism and white supremacy, but I, but I think that you can be actively trying to disrupt your own internal biases and still have in your mind an image of what mathematics looks like and who is invited into those spaces. What are some bias that you had to acknowledge that you were holding as it related to like student learning and then like after you acknowledge that, what are some things that you had to actively do to like disrupt that thinking? I looked at the data between my male students and my female students. Mm -hmm. And that's when I saw a huge difference in how they were responding to questions around classroom culture. Things like, you know, miss my teacher believes in me. My teacher shows me that I can, or makes, makes me believe that I can be successful. Um, my teacher takes the time to explain things really clearly. And while, you know, the results weren't bad, it was such a disparity. We're talking like 97% of my female students said this versus like 60 to 70% mm -hmm. of my male students. Um, and to me, that was like incredibly eye-opening. I had to, first I had to pause and think about like why that was happening. I wasn't surprised to see it, to be honest. Maybe surprised that it was like that stark of a difference. But I had to think about like, well, why was that happening? And I think for me, it was two things. One, being raised in a kind of like a, a, a female dominant household as a child, I just have been raised to kind of see the power of in women. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yes. And I think <laughs> that, that was coming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And so that was really coming through in my interactions with my with with uh, my female students is like that belief in their ability in their potential. And it wasn't coming out as much with my male students. And I could stop the story there. I could just say I had a strong belief in my female students and it just showed more. But the truth was, I was also harboring a lot of lower expectations for my male students because in my life I had had men who didn't show up for me and like just wondering how much was that coming through in my own teaching and interactions with my students mm -hmm. and that's that's a hard realization right because these are children they're not I mean and other than the interactions that I have with them in classrooms or seeing them after school in their sports or whatever it might be these are people that you know have like been in my life you know caused me any harm but realizing that like those feelings that i had towards men towards women were really impacting the way that I was uh instructing and connecting with my students that makes me think of all the work that you do around like teacher learning around identity and supporting teachers with like really tapping into who they are, the identities that they hold, and really understanding that, you know, the identity that you have as a person, an individual, really does impact the decisions that you're making in the classroom. I'm just even having an epiphany, just like listening to you say that, like the identity that I hold as a woman being raised by a single mother, you know, really impacts the thought process, thus the decision-making, thus the interaction that I have you know, with my male students. And I, a lot of people aren't gonna be that honest with themselves. I would ask the question though, because you, you named that, you know, you were holding low expectations. What does that look like for a teacher to hold low expectations for students? Yeah. This was a young girl. She had such a beautiful voice, like legit, like would bring tears to my eyes. But the way she showed up in class, she had a lot of math anxiety, like a lot of math anxiety. She thought everything was silly. 
absolutely everything. She'd fall out into like a fit of giggles. It was extremely irritating. Things like a kid would drop a pencil on the floor. That was hysterical to her. So she was really disruptive. But as I got to know her more, I realized that that was actually behavior that allowed her to disengage from the math and like find some type of other joy, whether it was like legitimate joy or not. She just was like a really giggly, really silly person. But something about hearing her sing totally transformed the way that I saw her as a student in my classroom. And like that wasn't even an interaction that happened in the classroom. It was on a bus, you know, somewhere in the middle of uh, DC. Like it made me see her, like her humanity in a different way. And I stopped interpreting that silliness, that like distractibility. I, I stopped interpreting that as a problem and starting to be like, why, like what's happening right now that's causing her to check out? You know what, Tamla? I don't know if that totally answers the question that you posed. But I, but I did get something from that. So what I kind of, what I'm kind of summarizing what you're saying is, if we're really going to allow students to show up as themselves and use who they are to move instruction forward, then that means we have to truly understand our students and be mindful of how we are taking like the ways that they their coping mechanisms for like coping in class or you know coping in areas that they may be uncomfortable or struggling with and we take those and we turn those into other problems. We turn those into discipline yes. or behavior problems. But really, it is about us getting to know our students, understanding who they are and how, like you said, like how they show up in the classroom and what that really means versus what we attach it to. Yes. Yep. That's it. Yep. Yeah. And real quick side note on the student, maybe, maybe two or three years after um, she had like I mean, she didn't graduate. This was in the eighth grade, but she had moved on to high school. So I hadn't seen her again. I get like a random call on my cell phone from you know, like a random number. It wasn't in my um, phone book. And I answer and like it was clearly a prank call because, you know, the caller said something about like, did you did you order a pizza? And I was like, no, but it was her voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I like called her. I was like, pretend her name's Samantha. I was like, Samantha, is that you? She was like, ha, 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 how do you know? <laughs> it was hilarious. I was like, I could tell your voice. And she's like, I just wanted to call and see how you're doing. I was like, I'm, I'm good. How's high school going? She's like, I'm doing really good. She's like, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm, I'm going to get emotional. She's like, I just wanted to say that like, I miss you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it like, it, it's crazy to think like, the impact that we have when we see them. Ugh. Teach it. Teach it. Yeah. Go ahead and scratch that from the no, 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 it's okay. Teaching is it's it's our life's work. And there there are so many people connections and even even though teaching is a science, right? It is a science, but there's so much relationship and people connection that goes into like really pushing students to learn and be their best. And that people connection has, you know, it's nothing that you could do to not account for it. It's, it's important. And I think sometimes, you know, people describe teacher learning it's just like this thing. Oh, like, hey, you know, let's talk about questions today. And that's it. And let's, let's write. But it's so much more than just that. There is a people aspect to our work. You can build somebody's math knowledge up. Like, I'm looking for somebody who's got heart, who looks at a student and says, like, I've got that kid's back. Like, I'm going to stick with them, whether they drive me crazy or not. Because to me, like, that's, maybe it is teachable. Um, but I think that that belief, that genuine faith in students is so much harder to cultivate than content knowledge. And, I, and I'm glad you said that faith in students, not the, 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 the need to save students. Yes, yep. Yes. But the genuine faith in the kid's ability. My, my, my daughter's teacher, uh, the first, she was a first year teacher 
And my daughter came home one day and she said, my teacher gave me a test. And the way that she described this test, and it was like the first week of school, I was like, wait, what? Did she get a test for this lesson? She gave it to the whole class. Really? And yes, the first week of school. And I remember being so upset and my daughter couldn't, she was seven, you know, she couldn't figure out why I was so upset. And the teacher called me in to like show me these letters and all this stuff. And this, this was like week two, right? And so what I named for her, because again, I don't want to walk in the door like, uh, <laughs> let me instructional coach you right now. I don't want to do that. But what I named for her, you know, as a, as a person fresh out of college, you already walked in with a deficit mindset about these kids preempting what you needed to do to save them, right? Or what you needed to do to get them from being whatever it was. I was like, you didn't walk into the classroom in the first week and say, hey, let me learn, you know, what you already know. You walked in on the first week and gave them an assessment to see who was dyslexic or who may have be a possibility of being dyslexic. And that is what like, to me, it was like that aha moment of like what it meant to walk into the classroom with you're thinking you're doing something well, right? You're thinking you are doing something good because I'm I'm assessing to see what, what their needs are. But you didn't assess to see what their talents were. You didn't mm. assess to see what their strengths were. You assessed to see what their deficits were. And I, I remember as a parent being really, really, really upset. Now I'm not that parent that's gonna go to the principal's office. <laughs> you know, I'm not that person, that person, that parent. But I, you know, I did name for the teacher like, well, why don't you give it some time? And then in a couple weeks, da, 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 da. And you can assess again and you can assess again here. You just can't make this assumption about a kid. We're going to school on the assessment that you got from your program. <laughs> but that's what I mean by um, what I had said earlier around, like so much of our bias is masked in good intention. Yeah. Where it's like, it takes more work to say like, where's the negative part of the bias? And, and that, that reminds me a lot of um, just kind of like some of the responses that we sometimes get from teachers that let me, that lets me know that like more work has to be done when we ask them to reflect on their um, their past learning experiences and think about how it shows up in their current practice as a teacher. Something that I hear a lot of teachers say, and it, and it even resonates with my own experiences, you know, math was a struggle for me, therefore I want to better that experience for my students. And I think it's really clear and, re and, and relatively easy for people to see how their own negative experiences, how their own trauma orients them to have higher expectations or a stronger belief in students. It's harder to think about how our trauma, how our experiences negatively impact yeah. students. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about like, what without blatantly outright asking it and scaring people away, like how do we begin to engage in that type of reflection? Because I think that that type of reflection and, and, and like just radical honesty with ourselves is what's needed in order for us to address things like the opportunity gap. You and I have talked about this before. The, the you know, the opportunity gap is that lack of access and even knowing that su certain students are withheld access we still continue to see those trends persist. So it's not a lack of knowledge. It's not a lack of, uh, of awareness. I think it's a lack of authenticity when it comes to self-reflection. And I just, I'm really curious about like, how do we get more people to that space where they're not just thinking about how their experiences push them to be better teachers, but how do your experiences actually limit limit the potential for their students? Like it's really hard to talk about race in front of, and bias in front of a group of strangers or even, you know, your, your colleagues or your peers, right? It's, it's uncomfortable for us to just talk about sometimes as, as, as friends, but just, but when you pose the question, it may be an uncomfortable space for me right now and in this moment, but that question still sticks in my mind. So I'm still an advocate. Just call the spade a spade, ask the question directly as it is, whether you know you see 
the impact of that question right there in that moment or you see the impact of that question later because you know we always get people who come back and say you know I've been thinking about that and if you've been thinking yeah, about it yeah. that's step one yeah you're you're totally right I, appre- I appreciate that reminder like sometimes you just have to plant the seed in somebody's mind like deep 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 into their like you know their their psyche and then just or subconscious and then just step away and like let it do what it has to do there's oftentimes trying to force people to have the ahas in kind of um like a predetermined like time and space like it's just not very realistic so i appreciate that reminder you're right and if and if we're gonna talk about disruption right so how are we being disruptors if we are tiptoeing around the question mm-hmm. so we see this all the time right in our states where we have to tiptoe around language yeah um, so how are we disrupting if we have to tiptoe around us a, a direct and forward question that we need teachers to think about we tiptoe um and that's not it uh, you can't disrupt quiet as a mouse you disrupt head on let's switch gears for a minute so you and i talk on a personal level and I know that somewhere in that mastermind, you have some things working and you are creating some curriculum, right? That oh, is yeah. going to disrupt the world, right? <laughs> so I want you to just share a little bit around what you are cooking up in that mind of yours that is going to have an impact on math instruction good instruction even times when i've been able to get my kids to be excited about slope or probability or whatever it might be like they still my students still have trouble seeing how is this connected to my life like the relevance of it it's okay for math to not have like an immediately uh, uh, an immediate applicability in my life the same way that you know you don't uh, the i heard this perfect analogy you don't learn art through paint by numbers and you don't learn art so that you can better interpret the color of a stop sign or like red light green light right like sometimes we learn things because they are beautiful subjects in and of itself and i feel that way about math i don't think that math always has to have an immediate relevance in order for it to be beautiful. Um, and I've had a lot of joy in, in helping my students get to that point where they're like, I'm just excited to come to this class. Kids who have like hated math and they're like, I love showing up in this class. Um, but with that said, there there are a lot of just incredibly interesting things about math that do have real life and immediate, uh, immediate application. So in my last couple of years of teaching, I started to think about just like really, um, I hear it in like anything that I do. I could be listening to a podcast or watching the news or having a conversation. And I'll think like, oh man, like that would be so cool to explore mathematically. A few years back, I had listened to this podcast. They were talking about these it was a country music lyrics. Um, and the lyrics were like about like a, ball, uh, a bar room brawl. But if you just read the lyrics, you can't, like you could tell it's about violence and about people fighting, but like you don't get a lot more context. And what they did was they asked people to read the lyrics and rate how violent they thought the lyrics were. And they had three cases, if I'm getting the study correct. They had one case where they didn't tell the people the genre for the lyrics. They had one case where they told them these were country um, country music lyrics. And then a third case where they said these are rap lyrics. And surprise, surprise, Uh-oh. the group uh, that were told the these were rap lyrics always rated the lyrics more violently. Yeah. Um, and I remember listening to that story and thinking like, oh my gosh, this is a perfect example of using frequency tables. Frequency tables are so silly to me as a teacher because they always just have really silly concepts to them where you're like, this, what is this? <laughs> this is boring information. So I started to kind of put together a lesson where we made sense of that and thought about like, were those two groups um, or did we have enough statistical information to say that people tend to rate rap lyrics more violently 
than other lyrics, even if they're not actually rap lyrics. So and that was kind of like the very first like aha that it was like it, really you could turn anything into like a mathematical discussion. It doesn't always boil down necessarily to like social justice or like critical consciousness. It could be um, thinking about how you can how you can play with the slope of lines so that they begin to look curved, right? So like just really interesting ways of like thinking about stuff thinking about like mathematical concepts that are like just kind of really dry and boring on their own and just kind of like pulling out the like the beauty that's in them or also the intrigue that's in them so yeah i started to kind of uh write something like a like a curriculum um, it was the goal as I was writing it was I didn't want to do one month, one week with my students, how, whatever that time frame was. I didn't want to like chunk the time and say, hey, we're going to talk about really interesting math and it's going to start from September and then we're going to go to November and then we'll be back to you know business as usual. I was thinking about how can I infuse it throughout the year? So that they kind of kept getting these little doses. And I also thought like that might open up the opportunity for them to kind of make their own natural um, connections between things. Yeah, I started working on that. And then I kind of shelved it as I transitioned to teaching lab. As you said, I like kind of picked it back up and- On the shelf. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's back out. I'm dusting it off. Okay. Um, I'm doing the work of taking lessons that I wrote for myself and trying to think about like, what additional information might need to go in here to like help somebody who like actually wasn't behind the scenes doing all the thinking also enact this lesson with high fidelity but also what i'm really intrigued or interested in is supporting teachers and like instructional coaches in creating the space and the opportunity to create these types of lessons on their own because i think really the best lessons are ones where uh, teachers make them to reflect the students who are in front of them. I had students who, like I said before, we were in a um, creative and performing arts school. So like it made sense for me to have and pull lessons that dealt with music, dealt with art, um, because those were the students that I was working with. But I can imagine in a school that might have, you know, a social justice initiative built into the mission. Right, taking more of an approach or leaning more heavily into that. I'm really interested in helping teachers create those those moments and experiences for their students. So that need that you saw, or you being able to identify that need around curriculum and supporting students with seeing, you know, the beauty of math, seeing themselves in mathematics. What role do you think your racial identity played in you uplifting that as an as an urgent need for our students? It boils down to representation. You know, at the, the beginning, I was saying to you that um, I knew I wanted to be in education. I wasn't totally sure that I wanted to be a teacher, but I was very much interested in like teaching and learning. And I think the thing that ultimately drew me into teaching, even though I knew it wouldn't be lucrative, even though I had taken out all those student loans, attending a private college, and I just knew that I was going to regret it, I still went into teaching because I, um, I had a really good mentor teacher um, my first and second year of college. She was in the math department. Um, and that was back when I was like, I'm gonna major in math. And to be honest, I totally just spooked out of it. Um, I was in a, you know, predominantly white institution. And to my knowledge, I don't know if there was a single black math major, at least not in the year where I <laughs> explored being a math major. And like, for lack of better words, it was it was lonely. It was it was hard. You're able to do hard things when you do them in community. And I just didn't have a community. Um, and even though I had a really great mentor teacher, I think she helped me name the impact of that lack of community. And ultimately I decided I wasn't gonna major in math. And that's kind of like something heavy that I carry with me now. Like I'm sad that I like got to a place where I felt my only option was to drop that major. So yeah, what propelled me finally into teaching was I never, I, I wanted to make sure that my students one felt prepared to be in those spaces 
if they had to be there, right? If they had to kind of do it alone. And two, to, to be an influence enough that, you know, hopefully I could encourage enough students to begin to go into math, be, begin to go into science, so that we could begin to start creating that community. So to, to go back to your original question, like what prompted me, like how, what role does my own identity play in, in wanting to create these experiences? I wanna make sure that any student that I get the chance to, the honestly, like the, the privilege to, to engage with, gets the opportunity that they deserve that I talk myself out of. And that what you just named is the power of a Black teacher to reflect on our own lived experiences and use those lived experiences to inspire, motivate, teach, allow students to flourish in spaces that we couldn't flourish in ourselves. So that is the power that you hold us with. I'm glad you shared that story. We always end <laughs> with you sharing three words. If you could describe the power of a Black teacher in three words, what three words would you use? I would say like uh, transformation, acknowledgement, and in and, and community, just because that last bit of our conversation is now on my mind. Well, thank you, Ryan. It was nice having you. This was a very powerful conversation, emotional conversation. You always get me in my feelings. <laughs>